Good morning, everybody. I see Spiro coming in. Good morning, Spiro. We've got Nate, Nick, Rolanda, hello. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. We'll get started in just a few minutes. Want to make sure everyone can get signed on and prior to us starting our webinar for today with Julie Winkle Giulioni. Morning, Tracy. We've got Stacy. Welcome, everybody. Good morning, Jennifer. Hi, Joe. Joe is our Philadelphia Regional Director. He's welcoming everyone this morning as well. Morning, Kirk. Oh, Mary, good morning. Good to see you. Good to sort of see you, I guess. I can sort of see your names. That's about all I get right now. <laughs> These days, that's great. <laughs> that counts. Exactly. We'll get started here in just another minute. So we want to make sure that we're mindful of your time, but want to also allow people to <clears throat> sign in here. We're, we're still getting more people coming in, which is great. And let's answer. <laughs> that is a good commute, Tammy. <laughs> yes. And Jennifer, you do not need to be on video. This can be a no camera day for sure. <laughs> good morning, Lisa. Glad to have you in from St. Louis. Oh, Tammy, you... where are you from? I'm, uh, I'm in Pasadena, in South Pasadena. So that wasn't a bad commute for me at all. Tammy used to come to all of our LA, I mean, she was one of the regulars at our LA IMS sessions at Brookside. So happy to see you, Tammy, today virtually. Look forward to hopefully seeing you in real life at some point, Tammy. <laughs> exactly. Good morning, Kathleen from Dallas. Ooh. Great to have you with us today. Ooh, in Cleveland. Oh, Stacy. Hey, how are you? Hope you're doing well. Well, why don't we go ahead and get started? I'd like to uh, welcome everyone to this virtual webinar with, with Julie Winkle Giulioni on budget conscious ways to increase performance and engagement. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Charles Good, president of the Institute for Management Studies. I'm joined today by Carla Peters Van Havel from IMS Corporate, helping out with the Q&A and discussion. And of course, behind the scenes and you can see him right now is John Peters, CEO and founder of Athena Online. Thank you for, to both of you for helping out today and going to make this a great session. So thank all of you. Before we start today and I introduce our esteemed educator, I wanted to go over a few items, a few of the tools that you're going to be using in Zoom. For communication today, please sign into today's session. Um, you, you don't need to sign in through the chat box today, um, but you, we are going to be using the chat box really for two things. One is polling questions. If you have any issues with seeing the poll, you can put your answers into the chat box for those polls. Also, if you have any technical issues today, please privately chat us through the chat box and let us know what those are. And then finally, 
the educator today, Julie, will be looking at the chat box when she's asking for some responses, so you can put some responses in there. However, we want to make sure that the majority of your questions go through the Q&A today. And the Q&A is on the bottom, is on your Zoom toolbar. You see it highlighted right there with the circle. So make sure you put all your questions during her presentation or after her presentation today in that Q&A discussion bar in the Zoom toolbar. You can also upvote questions that have already been submitted in that Q&A, making it more likely that we're gonna ask those to Julie today. So you can upvote them. That's a great way to ensure that those questions get asked. We're gonna ask her as many as time permits. Her presentation today is gonna to go for about 30 to 40 minutes and we're gonna have about 20 to 30 minutes of Q&A. So just keep that in mind. She'll try to answer whatever questions we don't have time for today in the threaded discussion thread for the post-session resources, which I'll go over at the end of today's presentation. So with that, I'd like to introduce, and before that, the one slide that I just wanna make sure everyone understands, if you have any connection issues, please, technologies are wonderful like Zoom until they aren't. If you get disconnected, log on with the same invite that you used to access this meeting to begin with. So rest assured, uh, we will be here. Um, the session's being recorded today and we'll be, and we'll be providing that recording to all that have registered um, through a post-session email that I'm gonna go over after the session. And with that, now let me try to introduce our esteemed thought leader for today. Julie Winkle Giulioni is the author, speaker, and consultant who helps organizations demystify what it takes to become a great people leader fire up the passion and the commitment of employees and keep great talent by activating and developing it. As a former professor, department chair, and learning strategist in the industry, Julie knows what it takes to ensure meaningful development. Her book, Help Them Grow or Watch Them Go, Career Conversations Organizations Need and Employees Want, is an international bestseller. Named one of Inc. Magazine's top 100 leadership speakers, Julie travels extensively speaking on a variety of leadership topics. She is a regular contributor to The Economist, Smart Brief, the Conference Board's Human Capital Exchange, and a variety of publications that offers thoughts on leadership, career development, and more via her blog. And with that, I'd like to welcome Julie Winkle Giulioni to today's program. Julie, how are you? Thanks, Charles. I am terrific, and I am so excited to be able to be here with everyone. And you know, beyond excited, I gotta admit, I am feeling really honored to be in the presence of literally hundreds of you who are clearly committed to supporting and uplifting those around you. It's, it's really inspiring. So thank you for making the time today. And as we get started, you know, take a moment to kind of pat yourself on the back for prioritizing yourself and prioritizing your people in the process. You know, I've been obsessed with um, engagement and, and performance for the past 30 years. And these are really evergreen topics that have been important for some time. And yet the past several months and the challenges associated with them have certainly punctuated the need for us to be really intentional and strategic around engagement and, uh, and performance. And so what I'd like to do is kind of anchor us for our conversation today in your experience, the challenges that you're facing. And so in the chat pod, if you would, in that window, making sure that it's to um, all attendees, would you kind of think for a moment about some of the greatest employee related challenges you've encountered since COVID-19 hit the scene? And just in a couple of words, would you capture what some of those challenges are? So go ahead and take a moment right now and you can jot those into chat. Ooh, recovering from layoffs, so many organizations and leaders are having to contend with furloughs and, and even more dramatically layoffs. Maintaining engagement, communication is huge. Oh my gosh, that whole work-life balance that's uh, even more challenging than before given the, the work from home conditions that so many folks are, are grappling with. I'm seeing tons of communication issues, balancing personalities remotly, uh, morale, um, 
staying connected. And yeah, isn't that the case? Despite the proliferation of technology tools, the fundamental ability to connect has changed as we've had to kind of all go to our, our corners and quarantine. Onboardings become increasingly complex, never something easy to do to bring someone into an organization and into a culture, even more so when, uh, when we're doing that remotely and virtually. Employee engagement, communication, um, the feelings that you receive face to face versus virtually. It's a different affective experience for sure. And of course, the, the impact on not being able to go out to travel to be with your customers, your clients with one another. The challenges are, they're enormous. I mean, really. And they're not going to shrink anytime soon. But what we all know is shrinking are our budgets, you know, our raise pools, our bonuses, the incentive dollars that we used to have, the discretionary tools in terms of dollars and cents that we used to be able to invest in our people. And as a leader, it's not uncommon to feel like, you know, your hands are kind of tied. Um, in terms of being able to, to motivate and inspire. Because without money, I mean, how do you engage folks? How do you reward great work? How do you retain your top talent? You know, how do you deliver on the, you know, still escalating expectations that you have for performance and productivity? But the truth is, the secret is, that even if your budget is absolutely zero, there are still four raises that are available to leaders everywhere. Raises that can elevate engagement and performance. And that's really the focus of what we'll be talking about today. So let me share with you sort of the game plan, our agenda for our time together. I want to spend just a couple of minutes talking about what engagement really is and why it matters, how it translates into performance and productivity. And then the lion's share of our time will be spent on these four always available and absolutely budget neutral raises that are at your disposal. And I want to offer you a dollar wise dozen, 12 specific strategies that you can begin putting in practice immediately to see elevated engagement and performance in your groups and in your organizations. And then finally, I wanna share one additional thing you can do that's, while it's intuitive, it's also a little surprising just how powerful it can be uh, in terms of making a tremendous uh, difference in terms of engagement. So let's get started by kind of quantifying the problem or the, the opportunity before us. And Charles, would you mind bringing up our first poll? Will do, I'm bringing it up right now. Awesome, thank you. So the question is, what percentage of US-based employees are disengaged right now? So you've got 55%, 65%, 75%, 85%. And if by chance you're not able to activate the poll, if you're not seeing the poll, go ahead and just uh, put the letter of your response in the chat pod. Getting some great responses right now. Julie, we're gonna leave it open for another 15, 20 seconds. But right now the clear leader is 65%. Sharing results with everyone right now. All right, thanks, Charles. All right, now looking at the poll results, um, we're seeing that B, 65% is the winner. And just scanning the chat pod, it looks like B with a little bit of a, a backup of C um, is also supporting that. So what you're going to be really surprised to hear 
is that it's actually 85%. According to Gallup, at least 85% of employees are disengaged, at least here in the United States. And as you look at global data, you see quite a bit of, uh, of similar uh, sort of uh, polling. So then the next question is, if 85% of the, the workforce is disengaged, what does that mean? What does that translate into? And so second poll, um, if you wouldn't mind pulling that up, Charles. Yep, I'm doing it right now. Thanks. What's the cost of that disengagement? And again, if you're not able to, um, to see the poll, go ahead and place the letter of the answer that seems right to you. I'm seeing Deneen is asking, is this due to COVID? The Gallup research that I'm referencing is actually pre-pandemic research. So, you know, it's a great question because in many of the organizations I'm working with, we're seeing obviously a drop of engage in engagement. Counterintuitively, in many organizations, I'm also seeing a rise in engagement. People are rallying to what's, uh, what's before them. Okay, let's see. And so we're looking at, uh, looks like in the chat poll, we're gravitating towards C's and D's. And what do you think, Charles? Do and we have a... Poll, we, um, I'll close it here in just a few seconds. I'm closing it now. We can see the results. All right. Thank you. And the winner is 50, uh, 150 to 250 billion. The actual results based upon work done by the conference board is D, 450 to 550 billion. And that's with a B, my friends. Stunning numbers in terms of productivity and the impact of, of disengagement. You know, you have to kind of ask yourself, how can this be? I mean, what is it that, and get, yikes is right, Mary, thank you. How is it that this can be, and what, um, what exactly does engagement bias? And as it turns out, uh, quite a lot. So depending upon whose research you'd like to look at, I'm going to show you some, uh, some of what Sean Aker, the researcher and author of The Happiness Dividend, has uh, uh, discovered. Engagement translates into happier employees, which is kind of a, you know, sounds like it's a, a nice to have. But the truth is those happier employees deliver the business outcomes that are most critical to organizations today. Things like sales, things like creativity, which inspires the, the innovation that's more critical now than ever. Things like productivity. And so clearly engagement is a, a really powerful tool in today's workplace. And yet, you know, it's one of those words that we throw around a lot. In fact, as I'm glancing at the, the chat window, I'm seeing several questions. Well, what do we mean by engagement? So let me throw that back to you. What do we mean by engagement? And in the chat window, would you share, again, just in a, a couple of words, what does engagement mean to you? And Charles is reminding us, if you've got questions, please make sure you capture those in the question uh, window so that uh, Charles and Carla can go ahead and uh, pull those out and make sure we get them asked toward the end of the session. So in a couple of words, what does engagement really mean to you? Okay, and so we're seeing feeling valued, passionate about work, generating new ideas, producing results, using my strengths, feeling valued, valued is, is big, being interested, the happiness that we were just talking about, a sense of empowerment, inclusion, commitment to the job and to the organization, proactive, you know, being willing to take those steps that maybe aren't even required of you, growth and investment, feeling like you make a difference, engagement, empowerment are, uh, are in many cases really synonymous to us, being recognized, being included. Oh, I love that, Lisa, a seat at the table. Pat, 
part of the vision, wanting to get up and go to work every day, that sense of, of really being excited about what's behind, uh, before us. Alexandra, that notion of problem solving, being ready to roll up your sleeves and dig in and do what it takes to make things happen. Productive, value, oh, I love that, a sense of presence and connection. All of that is what we're talking about when we talk about what engagement is. And of course, then disengagement is the, the absence of those things. Taking your role personally, Frank, I love that. Yeah, really making work personal to you. These feelings are what engagement is all about. And the exciting thing about engagement is that it doesn't stop there. Those sorts of feelings really inspire a willingness on the part of employees to invest, to invest effort. And that takes the form of time, of energy, of care, of empathy, of, of passion, of interest. And that effort that folks invest in the work that they're doing, it translates into performance. And I really think of this as the engagement ring because it doesn't stop there. You know, the momentum and the accomplishment, the sense of success that we get as a result of performance, it fuels greater engagement, which translates and taps into that uh, effort, which creates more performance. And we've got this upward spiral, this, this virtuous circle, if you will, of, of positive uh, results as a result of engagement. And the key is, the truth is, that getting employees into this engagement ring, it doesn't cost a thing. You don't need the traditional monetary raises to make this happen because you have four always available and completely budget neutral raises available to you every single day as a leader. The first one is you can raise awareness. And what we're talking about there is communication and the role that it plays in terms of communication in all directions to inspire engagement and uh, results. And communication was an element of uh, engagement that many of you identified in chat. You also, for absolutely no cost, can raise the stakes and really elevate the very nature of the work that people are doing and how they feel about it. And emotion really is a common thread that runs through a lot of how we define um, engagement. You can also, for no money at all, raise the bar and enable higher levels of potential and capability and contribution on the part of employees. And then finally, you can raise a glass and celebrate. You can infuse greater positivity into the workplace by recognizing all of the goodness that exists day in and day out and shining a light on that to elevate both engagement and the performance that follows. So these are four always available raises that cost nothing but a little attention um, on your part to those around you. And so what I want to do is spend the next couple of minutes just unpacking each of these briefly. And again, should you have questions, make sure you capture those in the question and answer um, pod so that Charles and Carla can pull those out as, um, as the session goes on. And we'll make sure we get as many of those answered as possible. So let's start with our first budget neutral, always available raise, raising awareness. And what we're talking about here is really multi-directional communication. And this first one, share information transparently and generously, you know, it's so obvious. I was tempted to actually just skip it and not even bring it up. But I'm sure you have the same experience that I have around uh, this, that common sense isn't always common practice. And it really needs to be. There's some research that was done recently by Interact, found that 
13% of employees believed that their leaders communicated effectively. 13%, a stunningly low percentage. But here's the kicker. That 13% of folks, they were 2.8 times as likely to be engaged as the rest of the folks in the study. People who feel like their leaders are effective communicators are going to be more engaged. So there's something in it for us to really consciously use communication as an engagement tool. And I have to tell you, the bar around this is pretty low. I'm doing a project with a client that's getting ready to go back to the workplace. And what they wanted to do was really capture the learnings and the good things that have happened during the last several months. So they could consciously bring that back when they, they return to the, the new normal in their environment. And so we're doing interviews with people. And I spoke with a, a young man last week um, gathering critical incidents and examples. And he commented that communication had really improved since COVID-19. And so I asked for an example, and the immediate um, example he shared was just earlier that day, he said that his boss had called and had told him that he hadn't been able to get an answer on something that had come up in their last huddle. And so, you know, I clarified, so, you know, so you're seeing that communication is better and yet you heard from your boss that he didn't have an answer. And the young man said, well, dude, he cared enough to pick up the phone and tell me. And I guess the, the message for us is, dude, you know, even if we don't have a big message to share, the intention to communicate carries tremendous weight. And so communicating what you can, when you can, is a driver of engagement. And even if you don't have something to communicate, communicating that can work as well. Now, communication, of course, goes both ways. And so the other side of the coin is listening passionately. Um, you know, as I talk to employees, what I've noticed is the ones who are most disengaged are the ones who really don't feel like they're being heard. And I don't need to tell you, human beings have a deep, fundamental need to be heard. You know, when you think about the people you love to be around, I would venture to guess it's the people who listen well, who really hold the space for you to share who you are. And so, you know, when you think about it, what, having a people have their voice heard is powerful. And yet I don't think we realize sometimes as leader, just leaders, just how powerful it is. In fact, people who feel like their voices are heard tend to be 4.3 times more empowered to do their best work. So again, there's something in it for us to figure out how to be present, how to be curious, how to ask great questions and really hold the space to listen to others. And then a third way to raise awareness, you know, it's important to manage and elevate the communication with your employees, but you also need to be able to communicate and navigate upward as well. A third of employees report that they can't do their job as well as they'd like to because of organizationally imposed restrictions and obstacles. So as leaders, raising awareness around that, identifying, elevating, working with senior leadership as necessary to resolve those issues, that stuff becomes legendary. You know, I coached several years ago a leader and helped her figure out how to eliminate this really clunky, redundant reporting system that they had. Years later, people are still talking about that. It's heroic when you just identify the roadblock and help move it out of the way so that people can do their jobs. So raising awareness and using communication strategically, not just for the 
the purpose of information sharing, but really connecting can drive powerful engagement and performance outcomes. We can also raise the stakes, as I mentioned before, by elevating the very nature of work and helping people to feel different, feel connected in a different way to the work that they're doing. And the first strategy for that involves illuminating impact. You know, most employees live in the pine needles, in the day-to-day -day detail of work. Now you operate at 30,000 feet. And so you can see how their contributions contribute to the whole, but they're just kind of treading water most days and don't have that visibility. And so to help elevate their engagement, connect the dots, you know, paint the big picture for folks frequently and vividly, but also paint them into it. Make sure they understand the contributions that they bring. Um, you know, for years, for decades, we've taught leaders about tuning into that radio station, WIIFM, you know, what's in it for me, and funneling what we want folks to do through self-interest. And we have forgotten how really fundamentally altruistic many people are. Adam Grant wrote in one of his books um, about some work that he had done with a hospital. They were having a heck of a time getting doctors and nurses to wash their hands properly, which you know, was scary then, even scarier today. Um, and it didn't matter how much they messaged, you know, doctor, nurse, you're gonna get sick. You're gonna hurt yourself if you don't wash your hands. They just couldn't make it happen. But as soon as they flipped the script, as soon as they said instead, you know, your patients are going to get really sick if you don't start washing your hands, compliance went right up. So as leaders, we can play a powerful role in helping to remind employees about how they help others, the contributions that they make to your customers and your clients and to one another because the meaning really drives engagement. Now, we can also facilitate human connections as an engagement strategy, and that came through loud and clear again in the, the chat as you discussed what engagement looked like and felt like and was to you. And I have to say the last several months have, have put a, a, an exclamation point behind this notion that that, that kind of connection is, is craved on the part of, of human beings. And it's really needed on the part of businesses. Ms. McKenzie had done some work and found that employees who feel connected are 20 to 25% more productive than others. So there's something in it for, for individuals and for the organization to really forge strong human connections. And so that means connections with you. Employees are desperate to have a connection with the supervisor. Some research that I did last year found that one of the top priorities employees have in, in the workplace is to have a boss that they connect with, that they trust, and that they respect. And so be that person. But also make sure that you're creating an environment that fosters connections among and between your team members. You know, particularly in a remote environment where you can't be everywhere at once, people support each other when those connections are strong. And so facilitating positive relationships among your staff becomes a key priority in terms of engagement and productivity and performance as well. And then finally, in terms of raising the stakes, changing the nature and how people feel about their work, enable more autonomy and choice. This is a fundamental psychological need and it's also a huge engagement driver. Um, and so what that means is as a leader, how can we shift control? 
how can we minimize the, the mandates and the directives and open up more space for employees to make decisions, to have choices, to guide and have some, some volition in terms of how they do their work. The key here really is to be absolutely firm on the what. You gotta, you know, have deliverables and outcomes and milestones and standards. So you don't want to give on that. That gets to, to be firmly entrenched. But where you can flex is on how. So if you have the endpoint well defined, can you let people figure out how to get there? And in that process, allow them to exercise some of this control, some of this autonomy that really builds that sense of not just engagement, but also ownership for the work. So the question to ask yourself really comes down to, you know, where can I turn over some choice, of course, with, with guardrails in place to ensure quality and, and the performance that's required, but where can I relinquish a little control and turn over some choice? And finding even a couple of those areas will be key to enhancing engagement and the effort and the, the results and the performance that follow. So raising the stakes is another budget neutral way to elevate engagement and performance. As is raising the bar, helping to activate greater levels of potential and, and capability and, and contribution. And it starts by striking the right challenge. I have talked to so many leaders over the last several months who have been totally blown away that despite the, the chaos of the working from home environment and the homeschooling and the dogs and, and everything that's come uh, with all of that, the leaders have been blown away by employees, the number of employees who are asking for more challenge. At a time when leaders thought they were going to have to ratchet things back, people are asking for more, more opportunities to dig in, to, to focus their attention, to, to contribute more. And so, um, so we have to remember as leaders not to, you know, kind of have assumptions about where people might be coming from and to really engage and make sure we understand what it's going to take to keep people engaged because boredom is absolutely the enemy of engagement you know the key really is to to collaborate and to calibrate with people to figure out what's that right stretch that just keeps them right on the the growing edge you know that stretch that doesn't break them you know, helping people to stay on, on the leading, but, but not the, the bleeding edge of the challenge. There's also the, the focus on feedback as an engagement um, tool. And I wanna read a quote that of course I can't find now. It's from Susan um, Scott, the, uh, the author of Fierce Conversations. And I'll probably foul this up, but I'll get the essence at least, so don't quote me. Um, but what she says is that people have a deep yearning to hear the truth, even when it's unpalatable, that we have this connection to folks who are willing to level with us. You know, it takes a certain commitment and a certain level of, of care frequently to level with people to tell them the truth, to give them the information that they need to be able to be more effective. And feedback is even more important to your top performers. You know, research from Zinger Folkman would tell us that your top performers wanna hear what they can do to get better, the constructive feedback, far more than all the things that they're doing well. And when it comes to feedback, a lot of people get caught up in the formula. You know, what's the right verbal formula? What are the right steps? And what I would suggest is it doesn't matter. Feedback starts with your intention. If your intention is to be of service and to help those around you, that intention trumps syntax any day. 
You can be clunky in your approach. The words might not tumble out quite well, but when people know that it's your intention to serve them, they'll get the message. So don't get caught up in, in how you do it. Come with the, the right intention to serve and the rest will, uh, will kind of take care of itself. And then finally, you can raise the bar through promoting ongoing learning and growth. And this is a topic that's near and, and dear, the topic of, of my book. Growth, development, career development, it's the number one reason people join an organization. It's the number one reason people leave organizations. It, uh, it's also been consistently over the last several years one of the top three drivers of engagement. People across the generational spectrum want to continue to grow and learn and advance. And interestingly enough, even since COVID-19 hit the scene and folks have had to, to grapple with all sorts of, of additional challenges, um, a Pulse survey that I, I did recently found that 75% of employees polled said they had as much time or more time than before for learning and development. They also report that it's more important than ever. And I couldn't agree more, you know, with the half-life of a technical skill being down to two years, with the fact that 85% of the jobs we're gonna be doing in the year 2030 not even being invented yet, we've got to keep skilling folks up and that doesn't mean formal training, although things like this are great, so don't get me wrong, but you don't have to wait for a formal intervention. You have all sorts of in the workflow, organic ways to support development. You can coach, you can offer stretch assignments, you can help people wring more value out of the jobs that they're doing add some variety to what they're doing, offer some visibility. The opportunities are, are bounded only by the creativity that you and the employee bring to the task. So raising the bar is a third budget neutral way that you can go about engaging and driving greater performance. And then finally, you can raise a glass. What we're talking about here is celebration, but not the, the pricey variety. One way you can raise a glass, one way you can celebrate the goodness that is around the workplace is by leveraging the strengths and the talents that people have. I mean, you know from your own experience, the power of feeling capable and accomplished and, and successful, that goes a long way. And, uh, and in fact, employees who are able to use their strengths daily report 80% greater, I'm sorry, 8% greater productivity, and they tend to be six times more engaged than employees who aren't using their strengths routinely. And so as a leader, you want to discover those superpowers that your folks have, tap the unique um, skills and talents and strengths that folks have and match those to the work that needs to be done. It becomes the, the ultimate win-win. We also want to make sure that we celebrate progress. You know, in today's destination obsessed world, you know, a, we tend to focus on getting there to the end point. And yet the end point in many cases is pretty far down the pike. And so we have an opportunity to, to really celebrate and punctuate the, the progress along the way. You know, we don't need to wait until the project is done. We can have milestones that get recognized. Midday check-ins with, you know, a virtual high five. We can celebrate when we get to the 50% point. Progress is motivating. And when we punctuate progress, we promote even more of it and create that upward spiral toward improved results. And then finally, we want to recognize progress, but we also want to recognize the results, you know, when we, when we get there. Um, lack of recognition for the work that people are doing, it tends to be the number one predictor of burnout. And I can tell you burned out employees are not engaged, productive, um, performance driving employees. 
And so we need to, we need to recognize, you know, results. We need to appreciate that. I know that leaders don't wake up in the morning thinking, you know, today I'm going to withhold appreciation and recognition from my folks. You know, that's not how we operate. It's just that we hit the workplace and we see everything that needs doing and that's not going well. And that's what gets our attention. And so we need to stop, shift the attention, give it to what is working. And it doesn't have to cost a penny. You know, sincere, heartfelt appreciation, an email, copying in somebody, you know, who, who needs to know about it, a handwritten note. I mean, you know, we all have those files that we hold uh, that kind of stuff uh, in. You know, it communicates value, appreciation, respect, and recognition. And of course, we don't want to forget to also recognize effort. Because even when things aren't going well, you know, even if there's, you know, an epic fail before us, the effort that's put in is still worthy of the, the attention of the recognition. And when we give that the attention that it's due, that effort magnifies itself into to future successes as well. And so what we've got here are four raises that cost absolutely nothing and that can drive tremendous engagement and productivity and performance. And you've got your dollar wise dozen, 12 specific strategies that you can immediately be putting in place that will impact engagement and performance. Charles will talk in a moment about the landing page and the additional resources that are available to you. But one of the things that you'll find there is a summary handout that just recaps these high points. If you're like a lot of leaders though, you may be thinking, gosh, you know, where do I start? Which one's most important? And the answer to that is really easy. You start by talking to employees, by asking them what matters, what's going to make a difference, what's going to help them feel more engaged, help them be more productive. And to make that easy, and the good news is, you know, employees are rarely shy about that kind of thing. So to make those conversations a little easier and maybe a little more engaging, on that same landing page, you're going to find a do-it-yourself card deck with 12 make your own cards, you'll just duplicate it on cardstock and cut them up, 12 different statements that speak to the different raises and strategies we've been talking about today. And so the, the way it works is you give it to, you give the statements to your employees, ask them to review, consider, prioritize, and then have a conversation about what's gonna make the biggest difference for them understand their priorities. And then as a leader, you can make a well-informed decision and a commitment to the actions that you want to take to support their engagement and to support the, the performance that will ultimately contribute to organizational results. So we've talked about these four raises, these 12 strategies, and yet there's one more factor that really has a tremendously profound effect on engagement. Oh, and Charles, we're getting so good at this, I don't even need to ask you. Thanks for putting the poll up there. So take a moment, if you would, to respond. Do you think that factor is culture and executive leadership? Do you think it's the economic outlook, manager, supervisor, health and wellness? And if you're not able to participate in the poll, no worries, just put the letter that resonates for you in the chat window. All right, it looks like, uh, gosh, you know what it looks like? It's one of those horse racing games at a carnival where the horses go, you know, a little bit forward, forward and then a little bit back, but manager and supervisor seems to be in the lead, um, both on the poll and in the chat. Thanks, Charles. It looks like you've stopped that poll. And yep, manager, supervisor is the winner. Certainly all of these have an impact, but when it comes right down to it, the manager or supervisor actually is the one that has the greatest impact on the engagement of employees. In fact, employees who are supervised by managers or supervisors who are engaged themselves 
tend to be 59% more likely to be engaged. 59% more likely. And so there's one last budget neutral idea I wanna share with you. We've got you know, one final kind of bonus raise, if you will, pun intended, and it's raise your hand. You know, you set the tone when it comes to engagement. People are watching, they're absorbing, they're reflecting your example. And so you can't expect people to demonstrate a level of engagement that you're not willing to demonstrate yourself. And so perhaps the most powerful strategy for elevating the engagement of others is to elevate your own, to take some time to really look inside, to consider what you need, what's gonna nourish your soul, what's going to allow you to generate the energy required to be able to perform well and set a positive example and make a commitment to that. You know, it kind of reminds me of the old um, flight attendant um, deal with, we've got to put our own oxygen mask on or our own engagement mask on, if you will, um, before we can help others be engaged. And so I invite you to think even for a moment right now, what would it take? What's gonna make you more engaged? And how can you seek that out? So with that, Charles, let me turn things over to you because it looks like we might have a few questions that have come in. Great, thank you, Julie. Carla and I will be handling the questions. Um, we have some great questions already. Just first, I wanted you just to clarify how to use that, that card deck that you've provided as a resource, if you wouldn't mind you giving us additional instruction. You bet. So it's four pages. You'll print it out front to back um, and in color, and then you cut it. You've got the cut lines there. And what it yields are 12 cards. And the cards are color coded and uh, encoded on the back to the raises that we've just been talking about. That's more for you than for the employee. But on the other side is just a statement of what they need, might need to be more engaged. And so when you're able to work with people in real life, actually giving them the cards and having them play with them, sort them, prioritize them, put them in the, the sequence that would really resonate for them. You know, until we can do that, maybe employees print it out and do it themselves, or they just look at the statements to prioritize the top couple of statements that express what might bring greater engagement to them. And then have a conversation, have them talk to you about what those items are. Unpack it a little, understand what's behind it and what that would look like for them. And then you as a leader can go out and kind of think on your own, what steps can you take to offer more control, give more recognition, find ways to help them grow, whatever it might be that they've identified would be engaging. And again, we're doing this for the engagement, but don't forget, we're also doing it because it taps that willingness to exert effort that translates into to performance. So it's good for the employee and then it's also good for the organization as well. Does that help, Charles? That does. Thank you very much, Julie. And Carla's gonna go through the questions right now. We're getting some great questions. If we don't have time for all of those, remember, as part of your post-session resources, you will have access to a discussion board with Julie that you can ask those questions. So with that, I'll turn it over to Carla. Thanks, Charles. Thank you, Julie. Julie, one of the first questions here is how do you handle the negative attitudes that may come during four raises? Yeah, it's a tough one, isn't it? We've worked with so many organizations that not only are, are grappling with not having raises, they're actually taking money off the table and people are reducing their salaries to be able to keep everyone employed. And those attitudes are, are indeed challenging. Communication is one key, of course. Um, helping people to understand um, what the reason is for doing this. And not just what the reason is, but what the benefits can be. You know, in so many organizations, 
you know, the decision was made to either not have raises or to reduce salaries so that everyone can stay employed. And so by highlighting whatever benefits, whatever rationale um, that resonates for employees, um, by making that obvious, it you know, certainly doesn't make the pain of a, a lower paycheck any uh, less painful, um, but at least it helps people to understand a little. The other thing is to really listen to these issues. You know, sometimes we, we lump the negativity into the attitude, you know, bucket. And it's really hard to unravel that and make sense of it or even respond to attitudes. Sometimes what people need is just to be heard. You can't fix it. You can't throw extra money their way, but you can really listen and be empathetic and let people know that you hear them, that you really understand the pain and the hardship. And, um, and then finally, offering the support that you can. You know, you can offer the dollars, but what is available to, uh, to them? What could you do, you know, yourself or organizationally that will help to, to bolster their spirits during this time until we get to the other side and things can return to, um, to a more, um, a more lucrative future. So, you know, communication, listening, and support are really the tools that you have to be able to manage those, those negative reactions and responses. And Julie, this next question kind of follows up on that, especially during COVID and with all that's going on, what are the other alternative methods for celebrating progress other than verbal? Oh gosh, I mean, man. Um, so you, depending upon the platforms that you've got, if you've got a video platform, you know, like Zoom or Teams or, or Skype or, or one of those, getting people together virtually for a celebration is always a, an option. I've started to keep a party hat and a little, you know, blower in my desk. Um, <laughs> we have little virtual birthday celebrations uh, with folks when we can't get together and eat cake. Uh, I've seen um, many organizations, many individual leaders have sent out just small things, not anything big, but some small little memento or, you know, a, I don't know, I probably shouldn't mention it here, but a bottle of champagne um, to uh, team members to be able to open uh, when you come together. So, you know, I think what it takes is more of the, almost the party planner sort of mentality to think about something that could be fun to, to celebrate. And the other thing is we can't underestimate the value of written um, recognition and congratulations. You know, um, especially now, I think that becomes even more important. And then finally, one last idea is um, go upstairs, you know, find someone at a more senior level of the organization to come in and communicate that appreciation, recognition, be part of that celebration. You know, this is a time when senior leadership is ready and willing to step in in different and new ways to support the organization. So take advantage of that, have them come in and woohoo right along with the whole team. And then how do you know what is the right amount? What is the right amount of recognition for each person, each individual? Oh yeah, you know, it's a, it certainly is, um, it's, it's unique. Um, what I will say is I've never had an employee tell me they're getting too much. So the chances of going overboard are probably not great. Um, you know, the, the, the complaints, the concerns generally come from not getting enough. You know, I think it's not so much a matter of quantity, but of the quality of it, maybe. Um, because everybody likes their recognition in different ways. It's not a one size fits all. So, you know, some folks just love to be the center of attention and be mentioned in the team meeting and others just die a million deaths when that happens. And so the key may be more 
personalizing the recognition to the individual rather than worrying about whether you've got the right amount um, uh, uh, going. I guess that also explains like with introverts too, right? They, that might how, be how you can align with what, what their needs are. Oh, absolutely. But it's not just introverts. I was talking to a, a leader recently who took over a team from a leader who was, you know, sort of me, me, me. It's, you know, I'm, I'm doing it all. And she had worked tirelessly to build a sense of we in that team. And she was sharing the recognition. She was making everybody feel part of the whole and had really started to turn the corner. And then in an all hands meeting, the CEO called her out for these results. And it was just like, oh man, she felt like she was back to square one. So we really do need to think critically about the nature of the feedback as well as you know, the quantity, making sure you're doing it enough. Okay, just a couple more questions for you, Julie. Uh, can you provide examples of what you mean by stretch assignments? Oh, sure. Yeah. So when it comes to challenge, um, so right there in the workflow, there are probably um, any number of opportunities, needs, voids that need being filled. So stretch assignment would be taking somebody, figuring out where they are in terms of their capability, figuring out what they want to learn, and then finding that kind of an activity that's just on the edge of what they can do, that puts them just barely into their discomfort zone, because that's where learning happens, and gives them an opportunity to try on new behaviors, skills, interface with new people. So it might be, you know, doing a presentation if there's something that they haven't done before or leading a project team with complexity that crosses um, different functions. So the stretch assignment, that the stretch nature of it is that it's just out of, of the range of their current skill set. So there's conscious learning going on, but also it's work that really needs to be done. So again, like I said before, it's a, a bit of a win-win at the end of the day. Growth, learning, engagement for the individual, and then um, the productivity and, and performance on the part of the, the organization. Thank you. And we have a couple questions here that also focus on uh, when middle management or a opinion maker, peer leaders contributing to a declining culture or spreading negativity. Uh, how do you handle that? What's the best way to deal with that person in the middle if they're part of the negativity? Yeah, it's rough, isn't it? Frontline leaders are just really between a rock and a, a hard place, having to manage whatever's coming down and what's coming up at them. You know, probably the best, um, the best strategy is, of course, to uh, provide cover for your team, insulate those you're responsible for who report to you to the greatest extent possible by offering candid feedback upward. You know, feedback goes in all directions. And so sharing in a non-threatening way with individuals the impact that their decisions, their communication, their actions are having on others is generally kind of the, the one-two punch that a frontline leader can use to, um, to keep things moving forward while change happens. Okay, thank you. And uh, if we didn't have time to get to your question, please do post that on the follow-up. Charles, you tell them a little bit more about that? Sure, I wanted to go over a few of the post-session materials that you're gonna have as a result of today's session. We apologize for not getting to all of your questions, but once again, what Carla stated, we will have those questions on the discussion board, which is part of your post-session resources. So moving forward, just wanted to kind of, before we conclude today, as a result of attending today, you're going to receive seven days of learning support. This includes micro lesson videos from Julie Winkle Giulioni on our sister company site, Athena Online. It's also going to include that discussion board that we discussed and a recording of the presentation. So we encourage you to take advantage of this. The link for that is below. We'll also have that on that post session email that we send out to all registrants either later today or first thing in the morning. In addition, 
on that post session email, you're going to also receive a certificate of achievement. That's going to be on there for you to download for attending today. And then in addition with that, uh, you'll have a post session survey. That post session survey is very brief, one to two minutes. You can see the link now in the chat box as well as um, on the slide. Please fill that out now or during the time when you receive it in the post session email. Love to hear any feedback of what we did well and what we could improve upon um, before future virtual offerings. And then wanted to also let you know next week we have a great session with Bill Hawkins, coaching your team during turbulent times. This is going to happen on July 16th from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. Eastern. Uh, Mr. Bill Hawkins, he's an expert in leadership effectiveness in association with Marshall Goldsmith Partners. He has worked with over 20 Fortune 500 companies in 17 countries. He began his career working for a division of Johnson & Johnson in sales and marketing. And for the last 20 years, he has worked with organizations to identify and develop high potential leaders. We had him a few months ago with one of our one hour free webinars and it sold out. So that's why we're bringing him back. He's a great resource for you to learn from regarding coaching and especially coaching during these turbulent times. So with that, I'd like to thank everyone for attending today. Hope to see you at an upcoming IMS virtual program. Hopefully everyone has a great day today and is staying healthy and well. Thank you and we will see you in the future. And thank you to our esteemed educator, Julie Winkle Giulioni. Great presentation today, Julie. Thank you Thanks, again. Thanks, Julie. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you, everyone.